and welcome back to thermodynamics so we are approaching the end or at least i guess we're in maybe the beginning of the end so we finished with rankin cycles last class although we'll talk a little bit about them again right at the beginning and now we're transitioning into internal combustion engines now we'll start today talking about internal combustion engine terminology so that we all have the right nomenclature for these types of engines but last class, we did talk about these regenerative Rankine cycles. Now, I think that these are one of the trickier cycles that we'll learn because we split the mass flow rate off between the high pressure and the low pressure turbine. And that's true for both the open and the closed feed water heaters, right? So you can do this with different kind of heat exchangers, but ultimately the purpose here is to lower the amount of heat that you're putting into the fluid before it gets into the high pressure turbine. Now, the reason we like that is because when we look here at the thermal efficiency, it's net power over heat in. And now we're using this generic version of this expression where we take all the power developed by all the turbines plus all the power developed by all the pumps. We know that's negative power. And then we divide by all the heat we add everywhere in the cycle. So, if we're talking about an open feed water heater, we've got two turbines, two pumps, and one place that we add heat. But the trick here is how do we find that diverted mass flow? Now, oftentimes, we will find that by doing a first law analysis on the open feed water heater. When you do this and make the assumptions that we usually make, you'll get the sum of m dot in h in is equal to the sum of m dot out h out and some of these mass flow rate terms will be a function of this diverted mass flow, y. And if you do that, you can get an expression for y provided you know all the enthalpies. It's similar in a closed feed water heater. Here we again, we have two turbines, a high and low pressure turbine. We have only one pump in this case, and we're adding heat only in one place. So it's not like the reheat cycle where we add heat in two different places. Although in real nuclear power plants or coal power plants, you're going to be doing both regeneration and reheat. But in this example, we're only adding heat in one place. Now, last class, we talked about finding why in the closed feed water heater. But my general advice is if you're looking for a mass flow rate, going to a heat exchanger is a good idea because you're going to get this equation that the sum of m dot in h in is equal to the sum of m dot out h out so if you know all the h's you'll be able to find some kind of a mass flow rate so with these closed feed water heaters we talked about looking at the closed feed water heater but we can also get an expression for y in this case in the condenser because in the condenser that's where all the mass flow rates come back together so we're going to have one stream that's at y times m dot total and one stream that's at one minus y times m dot total so here in the condenser you still have some expression or the potential of finding some expression for y using the condenser so if we do that we want to take the open version of the first law We'll make the assumptions that we would normally make here, that the system is at steady state, that in this heat exchanger, it's passive, so the power term goes to zero. We're going to neglect changes in kinetic and potential energy. And in this case, because we don't know anything about the cold side, we have to leave this Q dot term here, right? Because here we don't have some cooling water going in and coming out. So we don't have a term. We can't get rid of that Q dot term. But maybe in a problem on an exam, maybe you'd be given enough information to find how much heat is rejected in the condenser, or maybe you would, uh, you'd be told how much heat is rejected here. Now, if you did that from this expression, you can find that zero is equal to Q dot plus M dot times in this case, one minus Y times H3. That's the inlet here at H3, the undiverted mass flow plus y times h8 and then minus at the exit h4 that's times the whole mass flow rate so here in this expression if we knew the mass flow rate the total mass flow rate throwing through flowing through the system and we knew the enthalpies 
And then we'd be in a position where we have one equation and two unknowns. So here we would not know Q, and we wouldn't know Y, which shows up twice in this equation. So if there was some way for us to find Q dot, then we could find Y. Or if we knew Y, we could also find the amount of heat that was rejected in the condenser. So this is just a reminder that there's all of these different components we can do a first law analysis on but when we did when we talked about this last last we didn't talk about explicitly doing this in the condenser so with that i want to start to think more generally about these thermodynamic cycles so when you look at that list of things we still have left to do in the class it's basically we're going to do a whole lot of thermodynamic cycles and they can be tricky and each one has its own kind of wrinkle right or its own trickiness but i think we can look at all of these problems as kind of the same problem where we'll go through and we'll try to define a characterization parameter which is going to be the energy benefit divided by the energy cost now the greek letter we use here or the name we use here might change so if it's a heat engine it's going to be eta which is this efficiency it looks like a capital n in cursive right if it's a refrigerator we'll use beta which is a coefficient of performance for a refrigerator. And if it's a heat pump, we'll use gamma, which is a coefficient of performance for a heat pump. After we do that, we'll ask if we're modeling the different processes in the cycle as open or closed. That'll tell us which version of the first and second laws we need to use. And it'll tell us if we have to do conservation of mass, because if it's a closed system, conservation of mass is kind of not very important because it's just going to tell us all the mass always stays inside the system. After that, we'll get a bunch of expressions that'll be dependent on H or U or S, and we'll have to ask ourselves, what's the fluid and how do I fix all these states? So after we fix all these states, we'll either use tables in the textbook or equations. Then we can determine power or work or heat or heat rate. And once we get all that, we can feed that back into the characterization parameter that we've defined, right? And find the actual efficiency or coefficient of, excuse me, or coefficient of performance. And then sometimes we'll compare that actual efficiency to a Carnot efficiency. So how does our cycle do relative to an ideal cycle? So I think if we follow these six steps, we can really do any cycle analysis problem. And just these different cycle analysis problems are kind of like choose your own adventures where the answer to each one of these different problems will be a little different for each cycle we look at. But I think I've told you this before. I'm not a huge fan of memorizing things, maybe because I'm not great at it, but maybe also because I'd rather just understand a process or understand something rather than memorizing it. So here, I think we can break this six step process, which is not terrible, but I can break it down, I think, into three big questions that I want to ask about any thermodynamic cycle. So the first is, how do I characterize the cycle? This comes down to asking, what's the energy benefit and what's the energy cost? Because it doesn't matter if I'm finding an efficiency or a coefficient of performance or if it's a heat pump or if it's a refrigerator. This is always going to be, what's the energy benefit divided by what's the energy cost? Then I'm going to ask myself, are the processes in the system, am I modeling them as open systems or closed systems? Because that'll tell me which version of the first law and the second law that I have to use. Finally, I'm going to ask myself, what's the fluid? So is it water or something like it where we're bouncing back and forth across the vapor dome? Or is it an ideal gas, something like air? And I think if I look at the sort of the permutations of the different answers that I get to these three questions, then I have basically all the different subsets, all the different types of cycles that we'll do have different answers to these three questions. So if I can answer these three questions, I'll know how to go through and do a cycle analysis problem for any one of the cycles that we'll encounter in this class. So we've been talking about Rankine cycles, right? So if we look back here, so in a Rankine cycle, it's a heat engine. So we're looking at thermal efficiency. We model all the processes as open processes. So we use the open version of the first law. And we assume that the fluid is water or something like it. So we're bouncing for it back and forth across the vapor dome. So now we're going to open ourselves up to something that, that's pretty different, right? So we're going to start to talk about internal combustion engines, 
right? Now, before we do analysis of different systems, we're going to learn about technology. But, you know, when we think about these internal combustion engines, if we didn't have this flowchart, right, or this process of how we're going to go through and answer these things, we might think that this is completely different than a Rankine cycle, right? But it's it's really only partially different, right? It's uh, There's a lot of similarities here, or at least there's one big similarity from our three questions um, to Rankine cycles. So the process is at least partially the same as what we do when we're looking at Rankine cycle analysis. So I told you today that we're going to talk about terminology for, terminology for internal combustion engines. So what's an internal combustion engine? It's something that looks like this. This is a four-cylinder internal combustion engine. So basically we have a, a shaft down here that's spinning. And then we have these pistons which are moving up and down inside the system. And then there's these two valves. So one of these valves is for intake of clean air. And one of them is for exhaust of air where the air fuel mixture uh, has already been burned. So we're sort of exhausting this uh you know, used up fluid, right? Because we burned out some of the oxygen and turned it into carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and other waste products that we want to get out of the cylinder so we can get fresh air back into the cylinder. So we like internal combustion engines here in the United States. Um, we use them to drive every day back and forth to work, right? Um, or maybe depending on uh, where you live when you're here on campus, you know, maybe sometimes you walk to work, maybe you drive to work yourself, or maybe you take a bus, right? So internal combustion engines are certainly something that we use a lot here in North America. Maybe we're using them less, right? Because maybe there's this uh, uptake or uptick in the use of electronic vehicles. But I think the internal combustion engine is still the workhorse of how we get around. Um, but it's also, so even if you don't drive an internal combustion engine yourself, if you do things like shop at a grocery store, then most of the food in that grocery store gets there because somebody drove it there in a truck. Right, So a lot of transport of a lot of different materials happens by truck here in the U U.S. and in the rest of North America too. Right, So internal combustion engines are sort of the powerhouse of these trucks that are really the lifeblood of how products move back and forth across the country. So when we think about this thermodynamically, right, if we're trying to define the, um, the characterization parameter for these internal combustion engines, the first question we have to ask is what's the energy benefit? So the reason that we have an internal combustion engine, right, is because we're, we want to generate mechanical power, right? So we're trying to get power here, right? So if you were thinking about a tractor or something, right? So this was replacing uh, sort of muscle power from either a human or an animal that was maybe tilling the fields. And now we've got something like Gravedigger that's, uh, you know, jumping over a whole bunch of cars and crushing them, right? So here the energy benefit from this internal combustion engine is either work or power. If you think about the energy cost, right? So a lot of times if you think about the cost of owning a vehicle, so there's definitely some maintenance costs, right? But the normal ongoing cost is you got to buy gasoline, right? Which is, uh, you know, almost remarkably inexpensive here in the United States right now as, uh, as we're on lockdown, right? But uh, I remember before, so I moved here in 2013 from Canada, and in Canada, uh, when I left, the price of gas was about a dollar thirty, dollar thirty-five per liter, right? And there's almost four liters in a gallon, right? So now I think last time I filled up, which was, I mean, probably weeks ago, right? Uh, I, I paid something like a dollar eighty a gallon, right? So obviously the cost of um, of running the car depends a lot on gas prices. Right. But the reason that we use gas in an internal combustion engine is so we can burn it. Right. So gas is this um, stored energy in chemical form. But then when we burn it, what happens is we release heat. And this is one of those cases when, uh, you know, I know I told you that mechanical engineers, usually when we get heat, we want to boil water. But that's not actually how an internal combustion engine works. But it's still turning heat into work or power. Right? So you may have noticed from the answer to the last two questions that what an internal combustion is, engine is, is a heat engine. So we're turning the heat that we get from burning this fuel into mechanical work, right? into the spinning drive shaft in this uh, power plant. So if we're talking about an internal combustion engine, it's a heat engine. right? So we're talking about thermal efficiency, where the energy benefit is work or power, and the cost is heat in, or 
heat rate in. We, can, we also know from what we've looked at before that if we zoom out enough on the system, the net work or the net power is also equal to the net heat rate in or the net heat in. So we can find that net work in a couple of different ways. And we'll see that as we start to, uh, to do the analysis of these type of systems. Right? So in this way, internal combustion engines are just like Rankine cycles. It's still going to be net work divided by heat in, right? So it's still a heat engine, right? So that's one of our three questions, right? So the first question is, how do we characterize the cycle? What kind of a cycle is it? And this internal combustion engine is still a heat engine. So we're turning heat into work. The answer to the next two questions though are different. So the first thing is, how are we gonna characterize the processes that happen inside this cycle? So in, in a Rankine cycle, Right, so here we have the four component Rankine cycle. Each process happens in a different location. And the mass in the system cycles through or moves through all these different components. So each one of these components performed its own process. And each one of those processes was an open system process where mass flows through the component. Now this isn't strictly true for an internal combustion engine, but we will model all the processes in an internal combustion engine as closed system processes, right? So here we're going to have to think back, remember the things that we, um, you know, learned in this first third of the class. But even though sometimes one of these two valves in my piston cylinder assembly is open, so sometimes the intake valve is open as I'm, you know, is this piston's moving down and we're adding air into the cylinder. Sometimes the exhaust valve is, is open as this piston is moving up and we're exhausting uh, you know, spent air fuel mixture back out into the atmosphere. But we're going to model all these processes as being closed system processes. And we'll talk about why we do that as we move on. So, you know, even though the answer to our first big question is the same, the answer to our second big question is different. The answer to our third big question, what's the fluid, is also different. So in this Rankine cycle, we assume that the, that the working fluid inside the system is water or maybe something like it if it's um you know if we're performing this cycle differently you could do this with a refrigerant or something but basically you're bouncing back and forth across the vapor dome so inside the internal combustion engine we're going to assume that the working fluid is an ideal gas and that that ideal gas is air you'll see that when we talk about these internal combustion engines a lot of the assumptions that we make are not act actually true Right, so the working fluid in an actual internal combustion engine is, you know, it's sometimes air, it's sometimes a mixture of air and fuel. And then we burn that fuel, and that changes the chemical composition of the gas that's inside, right? We get this spent air fuel mixture, so that's different, and it's always changing. But we're going to see that um, in order to get answers with pen and paper, then uh, we're going to need to assume things, and one of the things we'll assume is that the working fluid in this internal combustion engine is an ideal gas, and that ideal gas is air, and that air is dry air. Um, you won't you won't deal with this unless you take thermo two, but um, it turns out air actually has water vapor inside of it, right? You you know especially here in the summers in Rochester, right? Humidity is kind of a big deal, so we kind of neglect the water that's actually. Uh, the water vapor that's inside the air too. So we just assume that this is only air, dry air, right? And that's why even though in some ways this internal combustion engine is the same because it's a heat engine, but the answer to two of our three questions here are different, right? So we're going to assume that the processes are closed system processes, right? So remember that uh, delta E is equal to Q minus W, right? So that's the version of the first law that we'll use. And we'll assume that the working fluid is an ideal gas and not water. So how we'll um, fix the states will also be different. Right now, this is it's always a bit tricky for me to teach this class because uh, I know in a normal class, you know, maybe I'm teaching to 40 students, but uh, there's invariably going to be some of them that are on the Formula SAE team, right, who know a lot about automobiles, right, in the automobile industry. And that's just not me, right? So I know that, you know, maybe some of you feel the same, right? That, you know, when I tell people that I'm a professor in mechanical engineering, right? A lot of times people be like, you know, 
Like my car's been making this funny noise. Do you think you can? And you know, and, and my answer is all you know. Like, I think you should see a mechanic, right? Because because I'm not, um, you know, even though mechanical engineering is my profession, I'm not a car person, right? So, but it's still important for us, right? So even if you kind of fit that same description as me, it's still important for us to understand how these internal combustion engines work, right? Because we may have to analyze them. We may even have jobs in the automobile industry. So it's nice to know some of the terminology here, right? So nomenclature for a piston, right? So this is my, you know, sort of crude 2D sketch of a piston, right? That's this dark blue part inside the cylinder, right? Which is this kind of upside down U-shaped thing, right? So what happens is as the engine is running, this piston cycles up and down. Right. I kind of like this animation. Right. So this is kind of what's happening is that over and over again, these pistons are moving up and down. And what happens is in an internal combustion engine, there's more than one piston. And each piston inside each cylinder is usually doing a different job. So you get kind of a smooth uh, production of power here. Right. So but as this piston moves up and down, it always is centered inside your um, cylinder. Right. And then. At the very lowest point of the piston's travel, we call this bottom dead center, right? Because the cylinder is, or the piston is dead, is uh, dead centered, right? Or is exactly centered inside the cylinder, and it's at the bottom of its travel, right? Similarly, at the top of its travel, the piston is at top dead center, again centered, and this time at the top of its travel, right? So you'll notice here that the piston doesn't go all the way to the very top of the cylinder. There's kind of this extra gap here, right? Now, the difference, the length between bottom dead center and top dead center is the stroke length of the piston. So in one stroke, the piston moves either from bottom dead center to top dead center or from top dead center to bottom dead center. So every time we travel that length, that's called a stroke. So if we think about, right, so this piston has, the piston face has some area, right? So here we'd have to kind of, you know, this is kind of like an axisymmetric thing. You'd revolve this around the center because these things are circular, right? And you would get, uh, you know, a, a surface area of the piston head, right? And then if you multiply that by the stroke length, you would get the displacement volume. So if we think about this, right, so let's say the piston was at bottom dead center, but an exhaust valve was open over here, so the piston moves from the bottom dead center up to top dead center. If this valve was open, what would happen is this much volume would be displaced. It would be pushed out of the cylinder, right? And then we would close that, and then we'd want to have some air come in, so we'd open a different valve, and then the piston would go back down, and we'd replenish, we'd get some fresh air back in that's equal to the displacement volume. Notice here that not all of the volume is displaced because the piston, top dead center, is not flush with the top of the cylinder. So not all the volume here is displaced. There's this kind of orange bit at the top that does not get displaced. So you only are displacing most of the air from the cylinder. So now in the internal combustion engines, you have this pretty important parameter that's called a compression ratio, right? Again, I, I just like this animation, so I put it into the slideshow many times, right? So if we think about the, the upper face of the piston, right? If it's at bottom dead center, there's some volume inside the cylinder, right? So that's defined by this top face of the piston, the upper face of the cylinder, and the sidewalls. Right, so that's this, you know, I've shown half the volume here in purple, right? But then there's also a volume that's defined by the sidewalls and the upper surface of the cylinder and the upper surface of the piston when the piston is at top dead center. So there's kind of two limiting volumes here, right? There's the biggest volume, which is the volume at bottom dead center, and the smallest volume, which is the volume at top dead center. So the compression ratio is a volume ratio. It's the volume at bottom dead center, that's the big volume, divided by the volume at top dead center, which is the small volume. So if you're calculating a, comp a compression ratio, it's got to be larger than one, 
So if you get a compression ratio that's less than one, it's possible and maybe likely that you've inverted the volumes, right? So here we always take the big volume and divide it by the little volume. And as we start to do some analysis on these internal combustion engines, we'll see that even though our modeling, we're going to take, you know, a lot of simplifying assumptions in these internal combustion engines, but we're still going to get a usable model that tells us how to improve performance. And one of the important parameters that we'll sort of, you know, combine or, or we'll look at to, um, what's the word, to, to sort of tell us about the performance will be this compression ratio. So we'll see that as the compression ratio changes, so does the performance. Another important parameter here is engine speed. So when you think about the, if you think about the piston in the cylinder, this looks like a linear speed, right? That the piston is moving up and down at some linear speed. But we got to remember that the piston is connected to some spinning shaft, probably through some kind of a four bar linkage, right? So, you know, if you're running your car, you'll notice that the speed of the engine is given to you in rotations per minute or RPM, right? Now, if you're used to maybe a dynamics class or something, uh, we'll probably talk about angular rotation, not in terms of rotations per minute, but in terms of radians per second. So if you'd like to turn RPM into radians per second, first you have to notice that this is rotations per minute. So in every minute you have 60 seconds. So here you divide by one by 60 seconds here to get rid of the minutes. But then every rotation, right? One rotation of the shaft is two pi radians. So you then have to multiply by two pi radians over one rotation, right? So if you do that, the minutes will drop out and the rotations will drop out and you'll get radians per second, right? So sometimes that might be a useful way to think about engine speed, even though that's not the engine speed that your, your tachometer will give you inside of your car. Another way that we can characterize engines is by whether they are two-stroke engines or four-stroke engines. So in a two-stroke engine, this is usually for a lower power device. So I have a picture of a dirt bike here, but also if you have kind of a, a gas-powered uh, weed whacker, right, or, or edger, right? So that's uh, also a two-stroke engine normally, right? I can't imagine that there's four-stroke engines that are uh, weed whackers, but maybe they do exist, right? And the way, the reason this is called a two-stroke engine is that there's sort of four processes that happen here, intake, compression, expansion, and exhaust. And in a two-stroke engine, this happens in two strokes, which means the piston goes up once and comes down once. Now, if we think about a stroke, right? So if you remember, right, this piston is actually connected to this rotating shaft, right? Sometimes called a crankshaft or a drive shaft, right? So for the piston to get back to its original position, right? So that it's in phase, that's one rotation. So in one rotation, you have two strokes, right? So in one rotation, right? So if we think about if this is moving this way, it started at top dead center, if this was at 12 o'clock, or, or, right? And then when this got down to six o'clock, right? Then this would be at bottom dead center. And then as we go back up to 12 o'clock, then our piston gets back up to top dead center. So in one rotation, we get two strokes. And in a two stroke engine, that means we've done one cycle because a cycle in a two-stroke engine happens in two strokes and we get two strokes for every revolution. Now, if your engine needs more power, you're probably moving from a two-stroke engine to a four-stroke engine. So this will be a bigger motorcycle or like my, um, my Toyota Venza is a four-cylinder, four-stroke engine, right? So it needs four strokes in order to complete a whole cycle. So basically for every stroke, it's doing a different process one stroke is intake, one stroke is compression, one stroke is expansion, and one stroke is exhaust. So now it's going to take two revolutions of the crankshaft for the piston to go up and then down and then up and then down again, right? So for a four-stroke engine, one cycle happens in two revolutions. So this is going to be important when we talk about um, power that gets developed by these engines. But it's important to remember that in a two-stroke engine, you get one cycle per one revolution. And in a four-stroke engine, you get one cycle for every two revolutions. 
right? So as we're sort of, you know, looking at how many revolutions it takes for a cycle, this is important. And then when we talk about how fast the engines is, is going, we'll want to find how many cycles happen per second. So knowing how to go from a rotation to a cycle is important. Another way we can uh, classify internal combustion engines is how they ignite the fluid. So there's spark ignition engines. So this is sort of a, you know, a typical gasoline engine, right? So again, my, my four-cylinder Toyota runs on spark ignition. So you might have spark plugs in here. You definitely would have spark plugs if it's a spark ignition engine, right? My uh, John Deere lawnmower, also the same. I just had to change the spark plugs on my engine, right? Doing some sort of normal maintenance here, right? And what happens is when we've compressed the fluid, right? Which in this case would be some air fuel mixture. At some point, there's some, you know, critical timing that's happening here. But eventually, right? This looks like a barbecue starter, right? And this, now we send a voltage pulse in here, which creates a spark in the spark plug. And now we get this high temperature, high pressure air fuel mixture. That spark goes off. And then what happens is we burn the fluid, right? Or we burn the fuel. And that makes it heat up more, which makes it expand. And when it expands, what happens here, you see the top of the piston, right? And when this gas expands, that pushes the piston down. And this piston is connected to that crankshaft. So in that stroke, as this gas is expanding, we call this the power stroke, it pushes that piston down, which is spinning that shaft, right? And this is why you often have or always really have these uh, cylinders in your engine are offset so that one of your pistons, if you have a four-cylinder engine, is always in the power stroke. So you get a smooth ride instead of kind of jerking forward, uh, you know, if they were all in sync. Right, so these spark ignition engines are good if you're uh, for lower power applications, uh, for lighter weight vehicles, and they tend to be lower cost as well. So this is a typical car in North America will be a spark ignition engine. But the other kind of ignition we can have here is compression ignition. So what happens is if we can compress the fluid, so as we uh, compress the fluid, right, um, what happens is the temperature of the air fuel mixture increases. So in a compression ignition engine, what happens is we, uh, we compress the fluid enough so that the temperature of the fluid gets high enough so that the fuel ignites on its own. So it doesn't need the help of this spark in a spark ignition engine. It's the compression here that gives you enough heat to burn the fuel, right? So here you use this for higher power, right? So if you have a high power vehicle and you want good fuel efficiency, then this is the type of engine that you had, I sort of showed that uh, that truck, basically that was painted like Optimus Prime, right? So that is, um, you know, that's going to be a compression ignition engine, right? So heavy trucks, buses, trains, there are ships that run on internal combustion engines uh, and some power generators will also run on these compression ignition systems. So now I wanna take you through kind of step-by-step step what's happening in a four-stroke engine. Right, so here we're going to have this picture, right? And I'm going to sort of tell you what's going on basically in this picture of, you know, the sketch of what the piston cylinder assembly looks like. And then we've also in the textbook plotted a PV diagram for a internal combustion engine that's a four-stroke engine, right? So here, if we think that, uh, you know, our piston was at top dead center. Now our crankshaft is, is rotating and the piston is moving down. Right now it's moving down, but we've opened this intake valve, right? So in this case, we're in the intake stroke. So the volume is getting bigger, but that valve is open, which allows fresh air to come into the, the cylinder, right? So here mass flow is coming into the system. This would be an open system process. Air is coming into our cylinder, right? So here, What's happening is on our PV diagram, our volume is getting bigger and our pressure stays the same because this is just open to the atmosphere. Now, in our next stroke, so now we would be at bottom dead center, right? So our piston moved all the way down. We, 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 this is like taking a breath of fresh air for the engine, right? Now, that intake valve is going to close. So now both of these valves are closed and it's a closed system. 
the crankshaft keeps spinning and the piston moves up. So now as the piston moves up, our volume is going down, which means that because our volume is going down and this piston is moving up, it's compressing the fluid, right? Because there's nowhere for that fluid to go because both the valves are closed. So we're increasing the pressure of our fluid, right? So we've moved from, from here, right, in this compression stroke, and we're moving up this PV diagram. Now, both valves are going to remain closed. If this is a spark ignition engine, which is what's shown here, right? So here's the spark plug, right? And now, bam, right? That spark goes off, and that causes this uh, fuel in the air-fuel mixture to burn, which causes the gas to expand, which now pushes that piston down. And because it's pushing the piston down, now it's driving this. It's adding work to this rotating shaft, right? So it's making the shaft work because the gas is doing work on the piston, right? So now what's gonna happen is, again, the volume is increasing, right? And the pressure is going down, but we're getting power out. So we call this third stroke here, the power stroke, right? So the first stroke was the intake stroke, then the compression stroke, now the power stroke, right? And now we've got this spent air fuel mixture inside our cylinder right so we want to get rid of that so that we can get back to where we started from right because that's what happens in these cycles is we kind of keep going around and around right so we got to get back to our first state so what we do is we open up our exhaust valve the, the shafts keep spinning but now it's pushing the piston up and when it pushes the piston up with that exhaust valve open we have our exhaust stroke, right? And now our volume is going down. We're pushing out this exhaust gas and we're getting back to where we started, which is at the beginning of our intake stroke, right? So here we have four processes, one for each stroke. And we just keep going around and around and around, right? And remember to get these four strokes in our four stroke engine, we needed two rotations of our crankshaft. So in this picture, you can't really see it, but um, each one of these different pistons is doing a different job. It's each in a different stroke of our four-stroke cycle, right? So one of these pistons will always be in the power stroke so that we get sort of this consistent power on the shaft and not this kind of jerking motion, right, where you're kind of, you know, katunk and then you wait for a bit and then, you know, I don't know, katunk is not really a very, uh, you know, technological term here. But we're sort of not jerking around, right? We're, we sort of have this consistent power that's delivered to the shaft, right? But it also means that one of these shafts is also always in compression. So one of these in the compression stroke. So one of these um, pistons is always adding power to the shaft. And one of them is always sort of taking power from the shaft, right? Now... Maybe you can appreciate this, but, you know, when we were doing these uh, closed system processes, uh, we usually knew something like, uh, you know, it was maybe a polytropic process, so we knew uh, pressure as a function of volume, right? So, and, you know, it was the best if, uh, if the pressure was constant, right? Or maybe if, uh, if the volume didn't change, maybe that was good too, right? Or, but, you know, it's complicated. Right. And this is even more complicated when we look at a cycle like this. Right. So modeling these internal combustion engines is really hard. Right. If you want an accurate answer, you're probably going to have to use a computer simulation. Right. Or a numerical simulation. It's hard to do this with pen and paper to really get uh, an, a super accurate result. Right. So the cycle, it's not adiabatic really anywhere. You have this combustion of air and fuel. Right. So there's this chemical change that's happening inside your working fluid. Kinetic energy here can be important because you've got these pistons that are moving up and down inside the cylinder. Um, it's transient, so it's not at steady state. So everything here is happening. Um, it's, things are changing with time, right? Things like temperature and pressure, even the composition of the working fluid, right? It's sometimes open, right? So sometimes either you have the intake or exhaust valve open, and sometimes it's closed where both of those valves are closed. 
So I hope you can appreciate that this is a pretty complicated thing to do, right? Um, so what we do as engineers, right, is a lot of times we're trying to, you know, either design a new system or make an old system better, even though we have imperfect information, right? So the way that we have to do that is we have to model systems, right? We have to kind of not let perfect be the enemy of the good. So we have to look at a process like this and make assumptions. Now, when we do that, we recognize that every assumption we make steps us further away from reality. <coughs> but the benefit we get is that we get a simpler mathematical model, something maybe we can do with pen and paper. So with these uh, internal combustion engines, we do something called an air standard analysis. So that's code, right? And it's code for meaning that we do a series of different assumptions. So there's lots of assumptions that we'll make when we're um, analyzing these internal combustion engines. Now, the danger here is that the numerical answer we get isn't necessarily going to be the right answer. So it's the answer that the model will give us. But as we make assumptions in a model, the model becomes kind of more of a cartoon and less reality, right? So it can still give us qualitative information, like how does performance change when we change the compression ratio. But the quantitative information that it gives us is maybe less valuable than it would be if we were doing some kind of a numerical simulation. So we're going to neglect combustion. Combustion happens in these engines, right? Because we have this air-fuel mixture. Uh, we add a spark or we get the pressure high enough so that that air-fuel mixture burns, right? But it's going to be complicated to include that because it means that there's this chemical change happening. It's probably not an ideal gas. It's different mixtures at different uh, times in our cycle. So we're just going to assume that there's no combustion going on. We instead, we'll model the part where the fuel is burning as just heat being added from the surroundings. And we'll model the exhaust when we're getting rid of hot air. We'll model that as heat being transferred to the surroundings. So now, we'll also assume that all of these processes, right, these four strokes, we're going to model them all as closed systems. So that means we're going to use the version of the first law that tells us that delta E is equal to Q minus W. Usually that means that we'll use specific internal energy again instead of using specific enthalpy, which we got used to when we were doing Rankine cycles. We're going to assume that all of these processes are reversible. Reversible in sort of the thermodynamic sense, which means that entropy generation in all of these processes is equal to zero, right? So that sigma or sigma dot term, if we were talking about a rate equation, goes to zero for all of these processes. What that means is that if we have a process that we're assuming is adiabatic, it means that it's also isentropic, right? Remember, isentropic means delta S is equal to zero, right? That's going to be the key. Whenever we're, and we'll talk about this as we sort of analyze different cycles, but whenever we're using a cycle that the working fluid is ideal gases, it's really, really important that we try to isolate or recognize the processes that are isentropic because we have special relationships when we're using an ideal gas for an isentropic process. So we need to be able to identify which processes sort of fit that bill. We're going to assume that the working fluid is an ideal gas, even though really it's some combination of air and fuel, and that this ideal gas is air, we're going to assume that it's dry air, even though real air will have some amount of humidity in it, so some amount of water vapor that's in that air. Sometimes we'll even take one further step away from reality, right? So you know that um, we can do variable-specific heat or constant-specific heat analysis, right? Variable-specific heat, we'd maybe look at table A22 if our working fluid was air, or A22E if we're using imperial units, right? But if we're going to assume that um, the specific heat is constant, then we might then call this a cold air standard analysis because we'll assume that the specific heat does not change as the temperature changes, which is kind of another assumption that we would make in these cases, right? So again, because we're making all these assumptions, right, we would write these down and we'd know that maybe qualitatively we know what's going on, but we wouldn't necessarily trust our quantitative answers 
to a high degree of accuracy, right? So it's important to realize that the results here may be more qualitative than they are quantitative. So there's another, we talked about how compression ratio is kind of an important way that we can characterize these different engines. Another kind of important characterization parameter for these in, internal combustion engines is the mean effective pressure, or MEP, right? Now, the mean effective pressure is defined as the net work for one cycle divided by the displacement volume, right? So what this would be is if you have, um, remember when we talked about uh, work being the integral of PDV, if the pressure was constant, we could take it out and that would just be P times delta V, right? So if delta V is our displacement volume and the mean effective pressure is some kind of average pressure, right? It's the pressure that we would have if this was a constant pressure process and we were displacing the amount of volume that we displace and we had the same amount of work that we were doing in one cycle, right? So it's just kind of a characterization parameter don't um, get caught up thinking that this is kind of like a physical pressure somewhere in the engine, right? So this is just a, a way to characterize how much power we're getting for displacement volume, right? So it's, it's not super physically relevant, but it helps us to understand um, the performance of different engines, right? So if you have engines with the same displacement volume, then if one has a higher mean effective pressure, you know right away that you get more work out of the one with the higher mean effective pressure, right? So it's a nice way to characterize two engines that otherwise look the same. If engines are running at the same speed, then a higher mean effective pressure also means a higher net work or more power, right? So it's a, it's a useful characterizing parameter, even though it doesn't have a ton of physical meaning, right? So how do we evaluate heat engines? Right? We know that the thermal efficiency is going to be the benefit divided by the cost. Right? So the benefit is the work and the cost is the heat in. Right? Or it's the power divided by the heat rate in. So we know that power is Q in minus Q out. Right? But maybe I want to find the work and the heat in these kind of systems. Right? And if I do, that means I got to use the first law. I got to ask myself, anytime I write down the first law, am I assuming the processes are open or closed? But in this particular type of cycle, in these internal combustion engines, we're going to assume that it's a closed process, right? So we go back to this sketch and we know that delta U, right, which is really delta E after we assume that kinetic and potential energy changes can be neglected, is equal to Q minus W. So our thermal efficiency is going to be work out plus work in divided by Q in, right? Or if I could find the powers, then I could do the same thing there, right? So this part is the same as the Rankine cycle, even though how I get these numbers is going to be very different, right? So how do I find work and heat? So for each one of the processes that we have in this internal combustion engine, we'll assume that it's either got something to do with heat transfer or it's got something to do with work, but probably not both right? Although the changes in one case, right? So if the process is adiabatic, right? We cross out our Q term and we get that work is equal to UA minus UB. If we say the process is passive, right? So we're adding heat or removing heat, then we would say that Q is equal to UB minus UA. But you don't have to memorize these equations because they just come from the first law, right? So again, trust the first law right? And worry about the first law to tell you the sign of what's going on. But now we got to ask, what's the fluid? We know that our fluid is an ideal gas, right? So if it's an ideal gas, that means we can use the ideal gas law. So if we're thinking about one state, we might have to say something like PV is equal to RT, remembering that R is the specific gas constant, which is the ideal gas constant divided by the molar mass, right? And if we want to go from state to state, then we might be able to say P1 V1 over T1 is equal to P2 V2 over T2. And we can say this because we're going to assume that there's no chemical reaction taking place. So the specific gas constant stays constant and they're all closed systems. So the mass stays constant too, right? But we could, if we knew the specific volume instead, we could divide both sides by mass and just have it be equal to R. So that would be P1 
little v1 over t1 would be equal to p2 little v2 over t2. So the nice thing about the ideal gas law is we can use it at each state and or we can use it between states using this p1 v1 over t1 is equal to p2 v2 over t2. How else do we find temperatures, right? So if it's the ideal gas law, right, or it's an ideal gas, then that means that we can either say that it's variable specific heat or constant specific heat, right? So if I know that the specific heat is constant, or sorry, if I know it's variable, then I know that I'll actually find delta U because I'll find U1 and U2 in my table A22. It'll be a function of temperature, right? And so I'll look at table A22. If I'm doing constant specific heat, then delta U will be CV times delta T. Remember CV because it looks like a V a little bit, right? V looks a little bit like U. So delta U is CV times delta T. Or you could just look on your equation sheet. If we have the special cases, right? Remember I said we always got to look for these isentropic cases, right? In this case, those isentropic processes will happen when we're adding work or we're taking work away, right? So when we have adiabatic processes. For variable specific heats, we'll use this expression which is the ratio of the reduced volumes will be equal to the ratio of the uh, VR2S, right? So this is the ratio of the reduced volumes, which we can find these reduced volumes on table A22. That's going to be equal to the ratio of the volumes or the ratio of the specific volumes, right? If it's constant specific heat, what we'll do is we'll look for one of these expressions with k in the exponent. We can use these uh, expressions with k in the exponent if we're assuming that specific heat is constant and a process is isentropic. In this case, T2s, right? So the isentropic outlet temperature over the isentropic, uh, I guess, initial and final temperatures, not inlet and outlet temperatures, is equal to V1 over V2s to the power of k minus 1. So here it's the volume ratios that are important. Right? And the volume ratios we're going to get from something like a compression ratio. Right? So we can use that for isentropic processes. So it's important to know where those uh, isentropic processes are. So what are we going to do here? We're going to look at three different kinds of internal combustion engines. Really only two. So we'll look at auto cycles and diesel cycles. Although the textbook also talks about dual cycles, which are kind of hybrids between auto and diesel cycles. The difference between these two, two cycles is the assumption we make when we're adding heat, right? So the assumption, how, basically how we model the process when the fuel is burning. So in an auto cycle, we'll say that heat is added at constant volume. We'll look at auto cycles next. And then in the diesel cycle, we'll assume that heat is added at constant pressure. So diesel cycles are a little trickier, and we'll look at them after we talk about auto cycles. Dual cycles are a combination where heat addition is assumed to happen first at constant volume and then at constant pressure. So if you knew how to do an auto or a diesel cycle, you should also be able to figure out how to do a dual cycle as well. So now, how do we find powers and heat rates, right? Because if we're looking at a first law um, equation for closed systems, it's going to be power or it's going to be work and heat, not power and heat rate. So this is why we have to sort of look at when we do a whole cycle analysis we'll get how much work happens per cycle but then we got to figure out how many cycles happen per second and that will give us joules per cycle or power right watts so if we want a heat rate it's similar we got to find out how much what's the net heat per cycle and then figure out how many cycles per second we have so how do we go from n right which is rpm this is typically the information we get from a tachometer two cycles per second, right? So here it depends whether it's a four-stroke engine or a two-stroke engine. So if it's a four-stroke engine, we know that there's two rotations for every cycle. So we have to take the RPM, right? First divided by 60 to get how many rotations per second. But then we know we need two rotations for every cycle. So then we would take rotations per second divided by two, and that would give us how many cycles per second we have, right? So then we can put this big omega up into one of these two equations to get the power or the heat rate. In a two-stroke engine, it's maybe a little more straightforward because there's one cycle per one rotation. So we would again take n and divide by 60 to get back to rotations per second, 
and then one rotation is one cycle, so the rotations per cycle is equal to the, or the rotations per second is equal to the cycles per second because there's one rotation per one cycle. So basically, if there's a four-stroke engine, you got to remember to divide by two because there are two rotations for every cycle. What if this is imperial units, right? Life's always a little bit harder in imperial units, right? So we'll find work per cycle in BTU, right? So then we'll have to go to cycles per minute again, right? Or cycles per second if you'd prefer. But cycles per minute is nice here because the uh, conversion that we have on the equation sheet is that there's one horsepower for every 42.4 BTU per minute. So if I can get the work in BTU per minute or the power in BTU per minute, then I can change it to horsepower. Now, horsepower is kind of ubiquitous when you're talking about power of machines here in the United States. So we're sort of stuck with this unit conversion here, right? Now we would do a similar thing if we were talking about heat rate and we wanted that in horsepower as well. So again, for a four stroke engine, we have to remember to divide the number of cycles per second or cycles per minute by two, right? Because the, or the rotations per minute by two to get cycles per minute. And for a two stroke engine, the number of rotations per minute is equal to the number of cycles per minute. So we just got two more slides here. So the second law in a closed system is usually pretty straightforward here. Right, so we know that delta S, which is equal to mass times delta little s, it's going to be equal to Q over T plus sigma. Right? Now for all of these processes, we're going to assume that sigma is equal to zero. That's the amount of entropy generated from the process. So because all of these processes are assumed to be reversible, then sigma is going to be zero in every case. That means if we're not transferring heat, then we have an isentropic process. You can see this on a TS diagram as we go from state one to state two, and as we go from state three to state four, both of those are isentropic processes. So how do we find delta S for ideal gases? So here again, there are um, several different equations on the equation sheet. Um, if you're using variable specific heat, remember when you look it up on table A22, you'll have this S superscript zero thing but delta S superscript zero is not the same as delta S, right? This is just the change in the specific entropy due to the change in temperature. We still have to have this pressure term at the end, right? And if for an internal combustion engine, typically we'll know the temperature ratio and the volume ratios, right? Because in these closed systems, we think about, you know, the volume at top dead center and the volume at bottom dead center. We think about that compression ratio. So we would typically probably use option B if we're going to say that specific heat is constant. So that's all that I have for you today. I'm happy to entertain any questions that you may have uh, before we take off. Um, could you go back a few slides to when you're on the, um, the air standard analysis? Sure. I'll just say one. This, no, probably not this one. Probably the one where we talk about we're listing all the assumptions that we're making for the air standard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here we go. Uh, four to slide. Four with one slide. I think it's yeah. This one. I think I think it was at the bottom of this slide. Yeah. This one. Yeah, go back. Um, and just this. I just think it's copy down the. Uh, oh, here. Yeah. So you just want to copy all these down? Sure. No, I have those assumptions down on the next page with MEP. I think it's copy down the um with right. same volume so and running pressure it. pressure is basically is sort of making up this fictitious process where we're getting the same amount of power or the same amount of work in one cycle that we would get inside our internal combustion engine cycle, but we're pretending that it all happens at constant pressure. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. That's all I had. Um, and just uh, as a note, so I'm happy to go back and look at these, but my uh, my notes are also posted on the my courses website. But I know it's nice to oh, okay. take notes yourself to kind of stay engaged in what's happening. Mm -hmm. All right, thank so, you. Any other questions? All right, thanks very much. I will see you on Friday.